you also mentioned earlier to me personally that you've worked on an algorithm or some part of the algorithm to improve travel time predictions that was actually implemented into Google Maps. So that's pretty cool and something that is completely applied in the real world. So could you tell a bit more on the whole process of make, making research and then how this was actually implemented into a real app like Google Maps? Yeah, this is a great question. And um, I feel like to me, this was one of the transformative moments when I worked on this because um, it allowed me to jump out of the realm of you know pure research where we were just concerned with putting out the solution that gets the best best numbers possible on a particular benchmark and you know playing with our different lego blocks in our little sandboxes trying to figure out what's the best way to stitch these components together without really having any regards to how this thing will be used in the real world right with google maps you didn't really like uh, have a choice but to consider the what the real world data looks like so you might imagine, you know, you take out your phone, you ask Google Maps, uh, point A, point B, what is the best way to travel from A to B? And uh, Google Maps will then give you a few suggested routes and it will give you estimated travel times. So how many minutes will it take you to travel from point A to point B? And this number is what our system was trained to predict. So. Uh, whenever you pull out Google Maps or whenever you use uh, an enterprise app that relies on Google Maps to tell you how fast your food is coming or uh, you know how fast your car is coming to pick you up, uh, you are interacting with the graph neural network that we have designed uh, at, uh, at Google DeepMind to, for this purpose. And uh, you then realize, you know, thinking about this problem, you would expect it's a simple pathfinding problem, right? Like you have the graph structure of the road network, you know roughly how fast uh, you know you can traverse each part of the road network, and that's great. You then just run a shortest path algorithm, and it tells you the travel time, right? But um, no, the real world is uh, much more complicated than that. Not only is it not static, so you have lots of uh, dynamically changing conditions on the road network that can drastically affect the predictions you get. So you can have things like changing weather conditions, roadblocks, traffic lights, all sorts of things that dynamically change the way the, the traffic flows in the network. But also the data itself is not as clean as it sounds. Specifically, the way Google Maps uh, collects these, these signals is uh, by using the phones, right? Your phones are in your car and based on the positions of the phones through time, the system infers roughly how fast the traffic is moving, right? Now, this is not only noisy, but also prone to adversarial behavior. So uh, you might have heard there was this uh, uh, infamous uh, adversarial attack where uh, a person put uh, 100 phones in a sack uh, and uh, walked down the street and uh, in the process of doing so convinced Google Maps to route all traffic away from that street, right? because it felt like there were a lot of slow cars in there, right? So in such a setting, you know, it's not easy to make these concrete, nice assumptions about your data. The data really is not that clean. And uh, based on this, uh, also keeping in mind that uh, this system has to serve, you know, billions of queries on a regular yeah. basis, touches a lot of users. It's a very important product. Um, and the thing that uh, you must also realize then in this setting is that uh, the research considerations that you might have, which is, you know, give me the model that achieves the best performance on this particular static training and testing data set split, which is what is a typical setting in most AI research papers today, is very different to what the real requirements were here, which is... Uh, really find me a model that first of all gets good performance on this data set but then will retain that good performance in the face of you know dynamically changing circumstances and uh, uh, different times of day and uh, potentially adversarial behaviors and stuff like that and then also at the same time it should be a model that is uh, very fast uh, to serve right so i can very quickly retrieve the results from this model and build a nice caching strategy around it and so on so that i can actually effectively serve billions of people's queries 
uh, without uh, you know causing significant slowdowns for the Google Maps mm-hmm. application. Because ultimately, you will care more about receiving your answers quickly than whether they are one or two minutes uh, plus minus wrong, right? Yeah. So this is uh, this is a key consideration, right? And uh, that's exactly the way in which the Google Maps collaboration uh, changed my view of research and how to make it useful to people. So a lot of the things that um, in AI research we might find is very important to please the reviewers uh, amount to basically nothing when it comes to plugging them in a real world system. And, uh, you know, this doesn't necessarily mean that we have to change the way we do research. Like research is structured the way it is for a good reason. Because it's exactly like trying to get to the bottom of how things work without being constrained by it being pluggable or scalable into, uh, you know, a big downstream system. But I also feel like uh, we would all benefit as a whole if we understood how our research can impact lots of people Mm -hmm. and what are the right ways to frame that research in a way that we can have the most positive impact. So... That's perhaps the main takeaway in how the Google Maps collaboration has shaped uh, my own personal view on AI research as a whole.